Let's have a prayer. Lord, we need you more than we think. We need you as our teacher, our guide, our lover. Be all that to us today, we ask. Amen. We're going to look at the most profound, beautiful, tender, comprehensive, significant chapters in all of literature. I've been reading for over 70 years, hours a day, and I assure you that what we're going to look at is the cream of the bunch of chapters. So would you turn with me to John, the 14th chapter. These chapters deal with our main problems of life. Nobody without problems, just as there's no unkept dog without fleas. Everybody's got them. We're all worriers. That's a good thing, except that we overdo it. If in World War II we'd heard that the uh, leaders of our government weren't worried, we'd have been worried. And if you know parents who've got half a dozen children, they say, oh, we're not worried about the kids. You know there's something wrong with them. So it's a good thing that we're worriers, but we overdo it. So here's a passage of literature that says, don't let your hearts be troubled. We also feel a great need to be of value. Is it a good thing that we're here? Do we have any worth? These chapters answer that question. And then how should we live? Most people have a fair idea what to do with money, what to do with politicians, but very few people know much about the important things in life. These chapters will answer all those problems. So let's look at the opening verses. When it says, let not your hearts be troubled, the word troubled is the word used elsewhere for the tossing of a sea, a storm at sea. Well, we all know what that's like in the heart. Maybe pain, if you have physical pain, you can't really think of anything else. But apart from physical pain, there are overwhelming problems for every human being. You know, there's a book being written that you all know of, The Road Less Travelled By, M. Scott Peck. The first chapter is called Problems and Pain. And the first sentence is, Life is Difficult. There are probably at least a dozen well-known books, bestsellers, that begin the same way. In our world, there are hundreds of millions of people who believe in the four noble truths of Gautama, the Buddha. First one, life is suffering. Second one, Suffering increases. Third one, it gets to how to eliminate suffering. And the fourth one pursues that path. So here is a philosophy where hundreds of millions of people believe that the big problem in life is how to deal with problems. Because life is hard. When you're very young, you feel sad that you're parents know so little and all the adults you know seem to be an ignorant bunch <laughs> and you long to grow up and when you do grow up like um, a famous American humorist Mark Twain, <laughs> thanks Jill, you marvel at how much they've learnt in the interim when you grow up. <laughs> <clears throat> if you're single there are problems If you're married, there are more sorrows than if you're single. You never realise when you pledge your love at the covenant, at, in covenant at the altar, that probably you will witness one death in the family among the parents. It's very rare husband and wife die together. 
So when we unite ourselves in marriage, we are really pledging that one of us is going to have to survive the loss of the other. There's something worse than death, the decay of love of one married partner for another. That's much, much worse. Emails I got this week, <coughs> and there were two of them about divorce from fine Christian people. So life is difficult, Scott Peck is right. What does Jesus say is the answer? Look at it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. The old version say you believe in God, but it's better trans laded this way, trust in God, but also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, as you may also be where I am. Just think on this. What's he saying? He's saying life has purpose. Life has meaning. You have a heavenly father. You do have someone who has all power and all knowledge who counts the hairs of your head, who attends the funeral of every sparrow. God cares. Trust him. Then he says, trust me. When God became flesh, he came to die for us, to take our guilt our sins, our burdens, carry them to the cross, bury them in Joseph's new tomb and leave them there for all who believe. That's wonderful. To know that you don't have to be good to be saved, though you do have to be saved to be good. To know that it's not who you are, but whose you are to learn that while we were <coughs> ruined without asking for it in our first representative, we've been redeemed by our second representative without asking for it. And to quote scripture that if one died for all, then all died. In the merciful reckoning of God, it is counted that you died on Calvary for all your sins of yesterday, today and tomorrow. When we go a little further in these chapters, we'll come across the words, you are clean. And a little further on, Father, they've kept thy word. Now you can't help but wonder, would the Lord of truth lie? Because they hadn't. And were they clean? They are about to run away from him. Leave him in the hands of enemies. And then you see the meaning of it. The unclean who believe are reckoned clean. The prodigals are called home and accepted. Zacchaeus comes down from the tree and salvation has come to his house. The penitent thief says, remember me and he's promised paradise. Well, however bad our friends or enemies think we are, we're not much different to those people, the penitent thief, the chiseler, Zacchaeus. Ye are clean. <coughs> They have kept thy word. These are marvellous statements in this book, meant to give us hope and courage when we feel depressed and discouraged because we all blow it recurringly. And we hear the Master say, you are clean. They have kept thy word. We're counted as though we're as perfect as Christ. That's wonderful. Well, he spells it out bit by bit. I go to prepare a place for you. So there is a life after this. This life's very short, sometimes very trivial, but there's more. If there wasn't more, this life would hardly be worth the candle. 
the fact that most people have contemplated suicide by the age of 40 is evidence of that fact. <coughs> you know, 10 times as many people contemplate suicide as ever succeed. More men succeed than women. More whites than blacks. More rich and educated than poor and uneducated. But Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust. Trust. You either got to trust in chance or trust in God. Take your pick. If you're going to trust in chance, anything can happen. If you trust in God, whatever happens will work for good. Even death, which is only a sleep of a moment. Next thing, the face of Christ and eternity. And he says there is a heaven. Our Lord had a real body, so he went to a real place. He says, in my father's house are many mansions based on the many rooms in the temple. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, he's told us all we need to know. He never answered all the curious questions that came, and he still doesn't. But all we need to know how to live, he's told us. And if I go, I'll come again. The world will not always be such a scandal as it is now. Christ is going to return. There was a first day, there will be a last day. You can't remember the day you were born, neither can I, but I guess it happened. <laughs> and as surely as the first day happened, the last day will happen. And as certainly as the world had a first day, so the world will have a last day. And he's not going to send for us. He says, I will come and receive you unto myself. Remember what we mentioned last time? <coughs> Joseph goes to Egypt, prepares storehouses, finds a land for his family to live in, Goshen, and then he goes back and brings them across to the storehouses and to the homeland. And that's what Christ will do. And next he says, you know the way. And one of the disciples interrupts him, Lord, we don't know the way. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. What a statement. You want to know how to live? As close to Christ as you can in this sinful flesh. You want to know what's true? What did Jesus say? say. You want vitality? You want healing? You want continuance of days for service? He is the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. Disciples are very thick-headed through these chapters. <coughs> they seem a very sorry bunch because they represent us.